When a community comes together for the purpose of solving community problems, it is a big deal. Heroes can be girls, boys, men, women, who when they are tremendously afraid are still willing to go forward. To do all that I can as your independent police auditor to help build that trust. Hi, I'm Judge Cordell, the independent police auditor for the city of San Jose, and welcome to the IPA Roadshow. Today my guest is Maria Perez, and the subject of our conversation is girls and gangs. I believe you will find the conversation that I'm going to have with Maria to be heart-wrenching, but also heartwarming. But first, I had the opportunity to speak briefly with Esther Mota to talk about the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force. The Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force does amazing, groundbreaking work. And here to talk about the task force and what it does is Esther Mota. Esther, thank you so much for joining me on the IPA Roadshow. And uh, tell us, tell us about the task force and what it is you do. Great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to, uh, you know, to your show. And uh, the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force, actually, it really is a collaborative effort. And it's between policymakers, that includes the mayor, the chief of police, it includes uh, superintendents of schools, and also the district attorney's office, but also it also includes community-based organizations, uh, you know, gang outreach workers that are out there, faith-based leaders that are really engaged in their communities, and also community uh, um, ac activists as well. And we also have many ex-gang members that are part of it, that are engaged in helping us, and really the purpose of the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force is to really identify and be current on the current gang trends and climate that's happening here in San Jose, and at the same time is providing services for those youth that are impacted by gangs, involved in gangs, with their families. Uh, again, just the support for them to know that if they want out of the gang lifestyle, we're there for them. We have people that care, that people who've been in their shoes uh, understand the type of services that they need. Um, and so that is what the gang task force is providing. Esther Mota, thank you so much for what you do and thank you for all the work that the gang, the, the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force does. And thank you for joining us on the IPA Roadshow. Thank you. Good. Welcome back to the IPA Roadshow. My guest today is Maria Perez and the subject is gangs and girls. And Maria Perez, thank you for being with us. And I, I'm so excited about having you on the show because you're somebody who can talk about gangs because you were there. You can talk about it from the inside. So mm -hmm. thank you for being here. And uh, before, so, so why don't we just start off with your telling us um, just where did you grow up? Tell us a little bit about your background and then we'll get to the gang part. Okay. Well, thank you for having me here. It's, uh, it's an honor. Uh, I grew up on the south side of San Jose and um, Grew up there, you know, was born and raised in San Jose. I attended uh, Franklin Elementary and went to junior high at Fair School and then later on Andrew Hill High School. So when you say we in your family, is it a small family, large family? Come from a pretty large family. There's seven children. Uh, I was, uh, um, or I am the eldest daughter. So you're, you're number, well, what number are you in the second? Second. You're second number two. And, yes, I'm number two out of seven, yeah. I have an older brother. Wow. Yeah. And were you raised, both parents raised yes. you or? Yeah, both parents. I was very fortunate to have my both parents, um, you know, raise us. And my father was a very hardworking man. What did he do? Uh, he was a janitor. He worked at a janitor as a janitor at a school, and um, he actually worked two jobs. And my mom was a homemaker, so my mom was a stay-at-home mom. And so, um, yeah, she was always there for us. Wow. You know, raising the family. Got it. So, were you? Did you speak Spanish at the home? In the home, or was English and Spanish spoken? Or? Yeah, we were, uh, my father spoke um, monolingual, he was monolingual, he spoke Spanish, came from Mexico. My mom was um, born in Texas, raised in Michigan, Marshall, Michigan. Mm -hmm. So my mom spoke English, and so we spoke both languages and we became bilingual. Wow. Yeah. So you are two-parent household, uh, you go to school, public schools in San Jose, mm -hmm. and um, so talk about um, what kind of a student were you in school? 
Mm, um, I think in elementary school I was very shy. I was kind of quiet, uh, wasn't very outspoken. Um, in the home, I think because as a girl, we weren't taught to really speak up, you know. Um, and so I think I was very, sh you know, kind of withdrawn, shy. In junior high, I think I was a little bit, I, I started coming out a little bit more, and I'm short, so I think I had this little complex and I had to be, you know, bad or prove myself, because, you know, people would pick on me or, you know, they'd, um, the girls, sometimes they were kind of catty and mean, so I, you know, had a tendency to, hey, you know, I might be small, but, you know, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, back, you, I'll back it up, you know, whatever, you know, so, right. yeah, I think junior high is when I started to kind of, like, get into some trouble. So let's talk about when now. So um, are we talking what years are we talking about when you were in, let's say in middle school, junior high school? Okay, middle school, I was about in, it was, like, it was like the early 70s. All right, so uh -huh. we're talking early 70s, 70s. at the time. Mm -hmm. So and you said you started to get into trouble. Yes. So what happened? Uh, well, I got introduced to a drug that was very common, um, and at first I didn't even know what it was. I thought I was, I was smoking a marijuana joint, and it turned out to be PCP. So um, someone just says, hey, try this, mm -hmm. and it was PCP, and, and you was, didn't know it. And yeah. how old were you? I was about, um, I want to say 14, wow. you know, 13, so what happened? 14. I uh, tore me up. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't get up. I couldn't talk. I don't remember. I have no recollection of what happened. Um, it was a pretty scary, you know, situation. Um, but at the time, it's like everybody, you know, the kids that I was hanging out with and the girls and the guys I was hanging out with, they all you know, we're starting to get into drugs. So uh, it's something that, you know, I, I didn't um, plan to live my life as a drug addict, but that was the beginning of being addicted to, to drugs for myself. Well, let me ask you too, So, because we, we're going to also talk about, uh, we're talking back in the day now, right? In oh, the 70s, yeah. where so many of our young people watching this weren't mm -hmm. even born then. Yeah. So were there gangs the way there are gangs now in, in San Jose? Um, yeah, it was, it was different. Um, after junior high, you know, um, I think it was the first year of uh, high school. I, I was a freshman, and there was a there was a change in San Jose, and there was families that were coming from like Southern California, and they were making their home in our in our neighborhoods. And so one of the gang the gang that were they I, Latinos you're saying coming yeah. up from Southern California? There were a lot of Latinos, okay. different. Um, and for whatever reasons, they were coming they were coming to Northern California to make their home. But a lot of them were seasoned. They were already, you know, um, they were already like very, you know, into the gangs. And some of them were very violent. And uh, we were at a at a place in our lives that I think we were just vulnerable to that because of our age, because of wanting to identify, and the pressures of adolescence and, and growing up. That we were we were just really ripe for that. And so that's how I got introduced by a family that came from Southern California and made their home in my neighborhood. So. Today there are gangs, we know there's Norteños, Sorenos in San Jose. Um, were there Norteños and Sorenos, those gangs, back in the day when mm. you were coming up? No, we didn't, we didn't identify with the North and the South, the Red and the Blue. We identified with Barrios. Barrios was a neighborhood. Uh, it was, uh, you know, we claimed like a territory, which it didn't belong to us, but at the time it sounded good, you know, we were ready, we were down for the cause, whatever, you know, we wanted to belong. So we claimed these barrios that we had really no clue what they were about, but yes, they were names of neighborhoods. And uh, so today there's still some that still exist, some of the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, we, we bonded and we clicked together as a name of a neighborhood. It wasn't colors. So at when the you time. were 14, uh, is that when you joined one of, the, one of the gangs? Is that how, when it happened with you? Actually, it was it was about 14. Um, I want to say 14, 15 that I uh, met this family, and uh, they again became part of our neighborhood. And so, it was a form of discipleship that they took us under their wing. My brothers, um, I have four brothers, and we all became part of this neighborhood. So and when you say others. neighborhood, though, and, and so it wasn't a gang, or what? What are you? Well, we didn't really. You? Well, at the time, we really didn't see it. We didn't know it was a gang. We thought it was like you know, it's a club or you know, something mm -hmm. that we're belonging to. It wasn't until we started running and doing you know the things that gang members uh, you know do, and 
we started to form enemies. We ha we started to fight. I started to witness things that I had never seen before. So talk to us about that, right? Talk a little bit about now it's starting. It's a neighborhood. It's gone from a club to more something more. Yeah. Uh, so there's now developing territories, and mm -hmm. it's not, you know, mm -hmm. maybe some animosity or hostility. Yes. So what what did you see, and what did you do? Well. At the time, you know, I was being a female. I think the role of the girls in the gangs is a little different than the males. And um, because I didn't get jumped in, I was one of the first female gang members that, you know, um, aligned themselves with this neighborhood. So um, I didn't get jumped in. But then we later on, um, you know, started to, if girls wanted to get in, you know, we, we didn't like us initiate them but they had to prove themselves to be loyal to to this to this gang what does that mean um, though what how does one how did one prove loyalty then well they have to you know not not tell on on what's going on you have to be able to stick to the to the group um, you know you just know if someone's loyal I don't know it's just it's just a, it's a it's a commitment to to you as a as a gang it's um, you just know by how people behave. You know if they're loyal, and if, and if they're not really committed and down for for the neighborhood, then we would not associate with them. So, what did you end up seeing? Well, um, I saw a lot of violence. I saw people get hurt. Um, I started to experience, you know, some assaults in my own personal life. Um, I started to feel different as a female, um, more like property and. Uh, just a, a less less free than I used to be uh, because so you, I couldn't associate with certain people. I felt like I had to belong to s these to the guys from the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and so it was. Um, I felt very restricted and very um, a lot of fear. I, had, I I started to experience a lot of fear because I didn't know what would happen when we went out. If we were going to fight, if we were going to pull up next to a car and the guys were going to pull out and start you know busting up windows. If we were going to witness you know. Some some shootings, some stabbings. I mean, because it so all came back down in like the that. day in the '70s when all this was happening with you, and now in the late 1970s, where was it? Was it gun violence, or was it not as much as that's happening mm -hmm. today? What was the kind of violence you experienced? Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't um, very. It was, I, I didn't see very many guns, although you know the the gang members. Yes, they they did carry guns, but it was more like knives, machetes. <laughs> machetes. Um, yes, machetes. Um, you know chains, crowbars, bumper jacks, whatever they could get a hold of, you know, to, to assault someone. But yeah, back in the days it was more like knives, you know, mm -hmm. switch blades and uh, they, that's what they would pack. What did your parents think about this? Did they know you were part of mm -hmm. the gang? Well, I, I think they knew something was wrong, you know. <laughs> they knew that we were running with some, you know, pretty hardcore people. Uh, I, it wasn't until I became a victim of the gang violence that I think my, it was a wake-up call for the whole family that my parents realized that you know, this, what are you involved in? It can, really can hurt. Can you tell them. us a little bit about sure. that? Uh, it was um, it was uh, New Year's Eve, 1979, and um, I had already been running with the gang for a couple years. And I was at a party, and I was talking to someone that I guess was I wasn't supposed to talk to. Again, you know, you're very restricted from you know associating with the rivals or enemies. So I'm talking to this guy who I thought you know he was cool. You know, he was in the neighborhood partying with us, and um, I just remember I was I was very highly intoxicated, so I was under the influence of PCP alcohol. So I don't have very clear recollections other than I remember getting hit really hard in the chest and losing you know consciousness. And I uh, I ended up in the emergency uh, having surgery. I had my right lung punctured, and uh, woke up to my parents at my bedside. And um, I I really it was unbelievable. That's it, that was a turning point for me that uh, this is not what it was supposed to be, you know. It became a lie at that point. I felt betrayed, and that's when my parents realized, you know, what are you involved in? You how, know? how old were you then, or what grade were you in? 17. I was 17 years old. It was my last year of high school. Did you graduate? I, by the grace of God, I graduated. I don't know how. <laughs> Really, because mm -hmm. I missed so much school and uh, I was gone a lot, you know, and I was heavily into drugs. But I did graduate. I managed to graduate. Yeah. So you're in the hospital and it's a moment for you when you say, this just can't go on. Mm -hmm. Something has to change. Mm -hmm. So what did you do? 
What was the change? Well, the change happened, okay, I broke out of that gang. I talked to my brothers. Some of my brothers were incarcerated, so they weren't around at the time. But um, I immediately started to experience intimidation by the rival gang members. And, um, you know, if you snitch, you know, we're going to kill you. And I became very angry. And uh, I just told my brothers, I don't want anything to do with this neighborhood. Uh, it's not what it was supposed to be, and they turned on me. It would have been different if I got hit by the enemy, but I got hit by my own. And uh, So this was all jumping out, just getting out, saying I'm done and still mm -hmm. having problems. So we didn't get jumped out. My brothers got jumped in by the gang members. And, and jumped they, in means they, they get yeah, they beat up. They got, right. Yeah, they got beat up, and they came into the gang originally. But when we left this gang, we did not get jumped out. And that was like a slap in the face. It was an insult that we walked out, that we said, you know, we don't want anything to do with you. And that, you know, it's like, you're not, you're not gonna just walk. So we had to pay a price, you know? And the price and you paid was? The price that we paid was that, that for the following two years, we were caught in a retaliation. They start, the, our home was one of the first homes that experienced drive-bys in San Jose. Before that, it was unheard of. And they came out and they started shooting our house. My father was shot twice in the shoulder and in the um, chest. And um, yeah, he lived with a bullet until the day he died. And uh, so my father, he was an innocent bystander and he was protecting his home. They came down one night and they started to break um, the windows of my brother's car. My dad came out and they drove by and, and shot him twice. And so that's, that was a heavy price to pay to see my father, you know, take a bullet for our wrongs. It was, it was devastating. For two years, we lived in hell, literally hell and fear of, um, you know, just mm -hmm. that, you know, any moment we can die. My grandmother lived right in front. We lived in duplexes on um, Center Road and, so my grandmother lived in the front duplex, and they didn't care if there was an elderly woman. My sister was maybe like three years old at the time. She was, you know, a toddler, and uh, so that was that, that. Just became so surreal to me that um, these guys don't care. You know, life doesn't matter, and so that was just a that that was a turning point in our lives. But for two years, yeah, we lived like that, and it was back and forth retaliation between my brothers. My brothers had to form another gang to protect the family from that gang. So they had to form a gang. We they formed to a get gang out to, of that life. Yes. So two years mm -hmm. of hell, yeah. and then what happened? Why did everything just stop after two years? Or? Yeah, it would be nice to say that. Oh, it just stopped. You know, okay. they got tired of it. <laughs> of uh, shooting. No, actually what happened is that in those two years, I went on a, I was on a search for, I was in despair. I was like running around. Someone's got to help us. I was also involved in the Chicano movement at the time. And so I, uh, I worked alongside, you know, some, some leaders in this community and um, trying to bring the barrios, you know, together and bring unity, um, which it worked for a little bit, but you know, after people partied and you know somebody did somebody wrong, it's, it was back to the war zone. So, um, but I remember going on a search and and just crying out to people like something's got to stop. You know, um, we're gonna die. You know, and and so that cry of despair caused me to really look inside, and and I became to have you know this hunger and the search for God in my life, and I had uh, met people that had turned their lives around through. Christianity and so I just I, I was just done at the age of 19 I just remember one day I, I was going to city uh, no, I'm sorry Evergreen College at the time and I was trying to better my life and I was walking around campus and I I was just like well, you know where's my life going here and I just at that point I just really felt uh, just a, a strong call and of God to surrender so you surrendered? I surrendered and, my life. And then you just, what, just refocused your life? Did you go back to school? What did, what did you do? So I surrendered my life, and but, you know, I, I didn't know I could just surrender my life right there on campus. Like, okay, God, here I am, you know, take my life. So I went to a church. And um, it was in that church that I found a surrogate family. You know, I found a family, and uh, 
because I think it's really tough for people to change. And being 19, you know, everyone I knew used drugs or, you know, was involved in gangs. And so it was really tough to find a new life alone. So I started to attend this church, um, Victory Outreach, and uh, it was there that I met you know, other people my age, and they were doing good things, and I began to, I had to unlearn everything that right. I learned in the gang, and to get my dignity back. But you and did it. Per I did. did it. And how I long did. a process was that for you? Uh, gosh, to change? I'm still, <laughs> I'm still, still change. <laughs> no. Um, it, you know, it was a matter of a couple years that I really, you know, came out of all of that, and uh, I got married, and had children. How many children and, do you um, have? I have two children. Mm -hmm. I have a 28-year-old and a 27-year-old. I was married for 18 years, so I, uh, we, you know, at the time had a business, and so I got a little taste of, you know, what, you know, living, uh, you know, a, a homemaker's life, uh, raising my family. I, I did start working uh, part time at the city of uh, San Jose through the. It was called at the time um, Cisa Puede interns, but I started working in uh, the gang intervention you know, work immediately after I changed my life. I wanted to give back and I really had a heart for the victims of gang violence. And so I started to reach out to families and young people. So for the past 25 years, I've been working with families and uh, gang members. And, and now today I've um, recently been working more like with the drug addicts and alcoholics. So let's, let's go back a bit now. So you are sure familiar with the mayors Gang yes. Prevention Task Force. What what are you What are your thoughts about it? I you know um, it's been a while you know since I attended a meeting because of my work schedule. But I had the um, privilege of being part of the panel this uh, last I think it was a, like a month ago, and um, I was sitting there and I was just amazed of how far we've come. I remember being part of the Mayor's Gang Task Force in 1993, and uh, when I was working for the city part time. And it was the best, the funds, best funds at the time. And it was just the beginning, the beginning stages of intervention, gang intervention work. To see young people form committees and working alongside of government um, and Latino youth, you know, it, it's really, it's really awesome to see that. Because I think that as a young person, that was my passion. And that's what drove me into community work. It was um, to see justice and to see you know, our people succeed and to have an opportunity for change. And so, so is progress being made, you think? I see progress <clears throat> being made. I think there's a lot more work to be done. Um, I see the need for um, the OGs, you know, people that have made it out of the gangs that have, you know, have a, can, can be an influence to young people that really still have to come out and and step up to the plate and be part of, of this, of the table, you know, and say, you know, you know, maybe I made some mistakes in the past, or maybe I, you know, I came out of prison. I did a lot of years in prison, but I, I believe that those are the people that the young people really listen to. It, you have credibility with them. Mm -hmm. and so let me ask you, you have two children. Yes. They're adults now. Yes. Did they ever get tempted by the gang life or ever you know, anyone try to pull them in? Actually, um, I think my son, um, we were involved in a drama called The Duke of Rowe which is a, a play that is, you know, I mean, it's very well known in San Jose as part of San Jose history through Victory Outreach. So my children got a chance to play the role on stage. <laughs> but there was a time where my son, did, he just being a kid, didn't see the seriousness of wearing red or blue to school. And having the knowledge I have and where I come from, I, I told my son, no, no, you will not wear red and you will not wear blue. Uh, my daughter didn't really flirt with that too much, but my son, he's like, why not? I want to wear And I said, because, son, you know, it puts you at risk. As a parent, I'm not going to allow that. And so I had to, you know, set some rules at home. I think he did end up wearing uh, at one time a pair of, 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 I think it was blue Cortezies or something that he would wear in the play to school. And so he did get beat up by some kids coming home. So that was like a wake-up call for him. And I said, you know, it's serious out there. And you could be innocent and just be wearing the color and be a target. But I told my kids, you know, if you need backup, let me know. Because I'm going to be there for you. So your mom will I'm, be there. I right? will be there for you. I'll be there for you at school. I'll be there for you 
wherever you need me. So, so you let's talk please. about what you do now. You said okay. you're a counselor. Yes. Um, you went to Evergreen. I actually went to while. Evergreen for for a short span. Yes. And then what? Mm -hmm. As and far then, as your uh, education, what did you do then? Um, I took you know I took some courses at San Jose State. Um, I didn't finish my my uh, degree, but what I did later on uh, is that I wanted to to come back into the field of drug and alcohol. So I took a it's a two year program drug and alcohol um, counseling program. I did it in like ten months. Wow. And uh, yeah, I, I I surprised myself. <laughs> It was an accelerated course, but in 10 months, I was able to get my certification, my education, and then I went and uh, I did like an internship. And, and where do you work now? I currently work at Support Systems Homes. It's a private drug and alcohol treatment center. Wow. And I, Here um, in San Jose? Yes. So uh, you're back in the community yes. giving back? Yes, and I work with um, the private sector. I work with the insurance sector, and I work with uh, state parolees mm -hmm. as well. So as we bring this interview to a close, um, there are among our viewers young people, wannabes, mm -hmm. uh, young people who maybe are in the gangs mm -hmm. and want to get out of gangs. Mm -hmm. There are parents who yes. are, I'm sure, concerned mm -hmm. about the future yes. for their young, their, their children. There will be police officers watching, mm -hmm. government officials watching. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's the takeaway from you, for you from the life you've led? You've been in the gang, in the life. You got out and you're giving back. What's the message to these viewers you know, about all okay. of, about gangs and um, what people ought to do? Okay. Well, one thing I learned in working with elementary kids is that by the fourth grade, if kids haven't learned to read, to feel good about themselves, to succeed in school, then they're at risk. And as parents, we have to pay attention. We have to know who our kids hang out with, what they're doing, who they're with, what they're wearing. You've got to be in their business. And because I think that's so crucial. I think parents are so busy that they have no clue what their kids are up to. You've got to love them, support them, value them. You know, be there for them. And not just by giving them things, but by really loving them and being present for them. And as a community, I would say that you know, whether you're an ex-gang member or you're a, a police officer, a teacher, I think that all of us as a community, you know, there's that saying that it takes a village to raise a child. I believe that. It took a village to help me raise my children. And I think we're all a really intricate part of this community. And I don't care who you are, you can make a difference in a young person's life. And just make, by saying something positive, by right. believing, by mentoring them, by helping them when they're in need. Well, Maria Perez, mm -hmm. you have made a difference. You're making a difference every day. You didn't have to, and mm -hmm. you've come back. You're, you're giving back to the community, mm -hmm. and, and that's the big takeaway for me. Yes. And I can't thank you enough for what you do, and thank you for coming on the show. Um, thank you all for joining us, and uh, thank you for watching the IPA Roadshow. <laughs>